Hello everyone, this is Jim from Executing English. It has been some time uh, since my last video. Uh, I've gotten some new gear because my the previous mic that I used was simply too, uh, too faulty. So uh, for this first video with my new wireless mic and the new camera, uh, I hope to be able to show and share some of the differences between Shangxi and International Chess. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of the articles that I have written recently after doing much research. Now um, there are many. I I googled on. <coughs> I went on to Google and typed in several questions, and these are some of the questions that I have seen, uh, which many people are interested. So after some decision making I decided to make an article about it because um, obviously a lot of chess players are interested in Xiangqi but do not know uh, what the fundamental differences are and this uh, questions are also seen in forums in China whereby a lot of people are asking what are the differences between international chess and Xiangqi so an uh, article is a it's quite a long one and I will just go through the brief points and I'll leave the link to my articles at the bottom of uh, this video. So to begin with, uh, the historical and cultural implications. Now the origins of Shang-Chi and international chess and whatever relationships the two cousins have uh, has long been a hotly debated topic. So uh, in this video I will not go over the historical parts of it. Uh, maybe I'm do, I am doing some research into the origins of Shang-Chi myself and hopefully I will be able to pre present my findings uh, very soon. Now as for Shang-Chi, the historical implications. Uh, this article, one of the research articles that I found was one by International Women's Grandmaster Liu Shilan uh, who wrote in a journal back in 2003. The journal was in Chinese, but a brief uh, translation of the title will be Understanding the Differences in the Culture of the Chinese and the West uh, from the Difference Found in International Chess and Xiangqi. It's quite a lengthy title, but I believe it's quite a good read. So, in a nutshell, the current form of Xiangqi that we play today was established no later than the Song, Southern Song Dynasty, uh, which was about, which is about um, in the 10th or 11th century AD. And this Xiangqi was a product of evolution of thousands of years, and more or less represented the feudal system that was present uh, that was present back in China at that time. Uh, Grandmaster Liu Shilan felt that the international chess that we play today probably reflected the early stages of capitalism in Europe. Now, these cultural differences had major implications on the way both games were played. So I presume that uh, as this article's video is targeted at international chess players and Shang-Chi players alike, I will assume that there will be some basic uh, knowledge of how to move the pieces or how to play the game. So as for Xiangqi, uh, Grandmaster Liu, uh, she reminded us that uh, many people view the game of Xiangqi as the standoff that happened during the Chuhan contention. Now the Chuhan contention uh, happened around uh, 200 BC or something. I'll check the dates later. And one side on one side was on one side of the Hong Canal was Xiang Yu, on the other side was Liu Pang. Uh, and there are many numerical symbolisms to the Xiang Chi bot too. Uh, there are nine files uh, which the which are the vertical lines of the Xiang Chi bot. And nine in, represents infinite in Chinese culture. And on the if the river on the Shangqi board were eliminated and all the squares were pushed together, we would get the 8x8 uncheckered board that is played, uh, which is one that is very similar to the one used in international chess. Now, in Chinese numerology, it would rep represent infinite extension and is often used together with the number 4 to represent the north, south, north, south, east, and west. 
or the four directions. So this uh, is the historical background for Shangqi, the Shangqi board. Now, as for the chess board, um, uh, there are many fundamental differences uh, that can be explained with the chess board alone. So uh, I'll go into them slightly later. As for the chess pieces, uh, in Xiangqi there are seven. In international chess, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, six different types of pieces, with the uh, with Xiangqi having the extra piece in the canon. So. Uh, Perhaps the most important uh, co concept uh, in this article that I would like to sh uh, share with all would be the concept of density of firepower. Now, this uh, concept is quite uh, interesting to me because uh, when I came across this article about eight or nine years ago, uh, I was quite astounded at the way that it could explain many of the fundamental differences between the two uh, the two forms of chess. Uh, this concept was presented by Huang Chen and his team. Now Huang Chen uh, and his team were also the people who invented the echo classification system for Shangqi openings. And they have their own website, uh, which is in Chinese, and they have their own Shangqi viewer called uh, Shangqi XQ Wizard or Shangqi Wushi. Now, to in a nutshell, the density of firepower, which I have translated from the original Chinese Huoli Mi Tu, it can be defined as thus. Uh, it will be the total piece value divided by the bot size. So, the total piece value of Xiangqi was 106, and the as there are 19, 19 interse intersections for the pieces to move, the density of firepower was 1.18. Now, in comparison, the density of firepower for the for international chess was 156 divided by 64 equals to 2.43. Now, how was this uh, how was this value arrived at? Uh, Huang Chen and his team, uh, they define the value, they could try to compare the value of the pieces in Xiangqi and international chess and try to uh, put them together in one table. So in uh, Xiangqi, uh, the pawn will be given only a value of one, but by the advisor will be given a value of two. Now, uh, elephant will be also worth about two points, uh, although some books give it give the elephant a slight advantage over the advisor with 2.5 points. And the horse and cannon, uh, according to Huang Chen, were, was worth uh, five points. Now, a bishop would be worth about the same. The chariot would be worth about the same in both forms of chess, uh, with the queen, with the queen worth about 18 points, and. Uh, these were the arbitrary values that uh, Huang Chen and his team came up with. So, uh, if you were to add the pieces in Xiangqi and the pieces in IC, international chess, you will see that Xiangqi, the pieces in Xiangqi uh, summed up to about 106, while the pieces for international chess, uh, the value of of the pieces for international chess was 156, uh, which is how this equation came about. Now, what are the implications of this formula? Now, according to Huang Chen, when the density of firepower was low, as in the case of Xiangqi, it would be more common to see the forces trying to create breakthroughs in the enemy defense uh, much, much earlier. And he used this to explain uh, the phenomenon that uh, you would often see in Xiangqi, uh, perhaps by the early mid game, uh, there will be early confrontations of the opposing forces. And uh, there will also be, uh, it's very easy for in Xiangqi for a single piece to infiltrate the enemy uh, territory very early in the game. So, as for international chess, when the when the density of firepower was higher, it would be more of a war of attrition, whereby uh, both players would try to wear each other out instead of uh, going head to head or going to a fist fight. Uh, trading material would also encourage the game to proceed naturally into the end game phase. Uh, in the mid game phase in Xiangqi, uh, 
there will be attempts to assassinate the en enemy king. So this would not be so commonly seen in international chess because of the higher density of uh, firepower. Now the next uh, point that Huang Chen and his team mentioned was the differences in the rules. Uh, the differences in the rules for Xiangqi will be much, much, much more complicated than the ones used in international chess. In fact, there are two official sets of rules for Xiangqi. Uh, these two official sets of rules can be, divide, uh, can be defined by the geography of the tournaments that where the game was played. For example, if both most tournaments in China adhere to the rules that were uh, designated by the Chinese Xiangqi Association over here, uh, which are called the Xiangqi Jingsai Guizhi. Now, this set of rules is very tough, and the main idea behind uh, the difficulty in the rules was to try to cut down on the number of draws in games and tournaments. And for tournaments outside of China, uh, in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in the States, uh, in the Americas, uh, the rules uh, by the World Xiangqi Federation, uh, the, <coughs> the rules by the World Xiangqi Federation are to be adhered to. Now, uh, one in 2018, the rules commissioned by the, uh, before 2018, sorry, the rules com that were used outside of China were by the Asian Xiangqi Federation. And uh, a lot of the Xiangqi experts and the leaders in Xiangqi uh, decided to come uh, to make that change, uh, slight changes on to the rules by the AXF. And the World Xiangqi Rules was born. And uh, for the first time, the World Xiangqi Rules had an English version and uh, they would serve to be the rules for play outside of Asia, uh, outside of China, sorry. And uh, I'm very, I was very fortunate and honored to have been, have participated in the translation of the World Xiangqi rules into English. Now, uh, the, the rules itself uh, can be bought uh, from online from a, one of the bookstores in China. And I will try to uh, post, a, post a link there. So, this is these are the rules for Xiangqi, which are which are quite complicated uh, as compared to international chess, whereby a set of rules by FIDE would uh, suffice for all. Now, for rules rules for the casual play, um, there are, there are several fundamental differences. First of all, perpetual checks are never ever allowed in Xiangqi. Any player uh, who has delivered three or more checks and has been won, who has been won but refused to change his moves, would be deemed to have lost the game immediately, even no matter how big an advantage or uh, a very big winning position he had, he would lose the game because perpetual checks are never ever allowed. And this rule, rule would rise above all the other rules. And in Xiangqi, um, a stalemate would be a win for the, uh, sorry, uh, still it would be a loss for the king placed under it. So if your king were placed in a stalemate, you would automatically, automatically lose the game. And uh, this is another thing that in international chess players might need to get used to. And there is no such thing as castling, uh, promotion of the pawns, or empowering in Shang-Chi. And Xiangqi does have its uh, interesting rule, uh, does have a very interesting rule called the Royal Rule, which states that the kings cannot face each other in the same file without uh, an intervening piece. So this rule would be ex uh, especially significant in the end game because when there are lesser pieces around, uh, it would give the king a chariot-like ability to control one of the files, either the fourth or fifth or sixth file. Uh, on the board, and there are all, there are some similarities for the rules in Shangxi and in international chess. Take backs are not allowed, etc. Now, for technical considerations, uh, because of the concept of the density of firepower and the scope of the pieces, uh, 
uh, these factors would change the way the game, the two games are played. So in Shangqi, uh, the scope of the pieces, um, there are three pieces that are limited uh, greatly in the scope of the movement. They will be the advisor, the elephant, and the pawn. The advisor cannot leave the palace. The elephant cannot leave his, uh, leave the side of the board. And the pawn can only advance and never retreat. And it has to cross the river before it can, uh, it is able, or it, it is allowed to traverse to the adjacent inter intersection. And because the pawn um, is usually one of the last pieces to be mobilized into the final attack, uh, often, more often than not, the pawn, the advancing the pawn, uh, is a great skill that has to be mastered in the Xiangqi end game. Because once the pawn reaches the enemy's uh, bottom rank, uh, it will be worth very little in value because it can only traverse the board and only do so much. So, because the scope of these three pieces are very limited, this would uh, give Xiangqi a more territorial uh, aspect to it. So, and because the board is much bigger, there are natural lines uh, which Huang Chen and his team coined. Uh, then there are natural lines for the pieces to move. Uh, actually, you can define the natural lines as the open lines that are already uh, apparent right at the beginning of the game and these open files would be the second, the fourth, the sixth, the eighth file and as for the ranks, uh, the throat rank and the riverbank rank would be the open lines that uh, pieces can be maneuvered to and because they are open files this will explain why a lot of uh, opening tactics or strategies would be centered around controlling these open files. The more uh, open files can, can be controlled, will mean that the enemy or your opponent would have much limited space. So this is another very important concept because there are no such things as pawn structures uh, in Shangqi. In fact, pawns are often sacrificed right at the beginning to gain tempai. So, the density of firepower would also explain uh, this concept. And another interesting concept that Huang Chen uh, pointed out was the concept of soul pieces. Now, in international chess, the soul piece would be very obvious. It would be the pawn and its pawn structure. However, in Xiangqi, uh, Huang Chen defined uh, the soul piece as any piece that whose method of capture did not coincide with the way it moved. So there was there will only be one candidate and it will be the cannon, which will need a cannon mount before uh, it can capture enemy material. And because of the way the moves uh <coughs> sorry, because because of the way some of the pieces move, there is a three dimensional concept uh, to both forms of chess and Huang Chen uh, believed that because the elephant and the horse in Xiangqi can be blocked, uh, this would be in effect a, a adaptation of the three-dimensional concept. And also the cannon would require cannon mounts to capture enemy material. So uh, because the because the horse and cannon, uh, sorry, the horse and elephant can be blocked. Uh, discovered attacks can be more easily arranged and are more commonly seen in Shangqi than in international chess. And because any piece can be used as a cannon mount, even though an, a piece might not be, might not do anything much, uh, the mere fact that it, it can act as a cannon mount would imply that. Uh, it can be used to help control a very important line, a be a file or a, frank, uh, or a rank. Sorry. And the initial defensive formations would be different in international chess and Xiangqi. Uh, for international chess, the initial defensive formations would be the pawn structure, obviously. And the king uh, can often castle either king side or queen side to, uh, to a more favorable position. and these two things would pick up for most of the defense of the king. 
However, in Xiangqi, uh, the advisors and the elephants would shoulder the responsibility for protecting the king right at the beginning. However, as they are limit, as they are, the advisor and the king are limited to the palace, and it would not be so easy for enemy material to attack the king right at the beginning, especially in the opening phase. Uh, usually, little defense is done, so you don't see uh, people moving advisors or elephants here and there, or in particular positions uh, in the Xiangqi openings most of the time. There are several variations whereby the advisors and kings are played to allow for development of the chariot, uh, but overall, this is a rare uh, phenomenon and. Uh, there's, there was, it would seem that there would be much less emphasis on defense of the king right at the beginning of the game. And the, there's also the function and status of the king, uh, which I will leave you to read for yourself. So this is a very nice summary that Huang Chen gave, which I translated. So if we were to reflect on the concepts of the density of firepower, the natural, the natural the natural lines, natural lines of formations of movement, the soul pieces, the three-dimensional concept. We would, so if you were to spend a little bit of time to think about it, uh, you would maybe you would explain a lot of uh, differences in Shangqi and international chess. Now uh, we go to the opening phase. Uh, both forms of chess have. Uh, have an opening, opening phase, and uh, it remains one of the most uh, sort of the areas of study. However, however in Xiangqi, uh, the emphasis would be in the opening phase would be on the mobilization of, of the pieces as early as possible. Uh, one very glaring, uh, one very glaring uh, concept in Xiangqi that is different from international chess is that the major pieces are encouraged to be moved or developed as fast as possible. So you often, uh, there is a Chinese uh, Shangxi saying whereby, uh, which goes something like this, if you do not develop your chariot by the third move, you will lose the game. So although this is not necessarily true, it shows the importance of developing the major pieces, especially the, cha the chariot in the early stages of the game. So this is one very glaring difference uh, between Shangqi and international chess, whereby the major pieces like the chariot, the chariot, the horse, uh, etc. would usually join in the attack slightly or even much later in the game. And mobilization of the pieces in the correct order is also critical because um, a lower density of firepower in Xiangqi would make common sense to try to occupy the focal point or important lines on the board. So the exact opposite would be true for international chess which with a higher density of firepower. So you know, this, will, um, this will further emphasize the fact that I just mentioned. Uh, and controlling the important regions on the board. So because there's no pawn structure, the in Shangqi, you would have to try to move the horse, uh, sorry, the cannon and chariot early in the game, and the horse slightly later in the game, try to to try to occupy important lines. Okay, and uh, balance balance in the development of, of the pieces is also very a very important issue in Shangqi. Okay, um, and because of this, the, the open nature of the Shangqi board, uh, many different formations uh, would occur, which can be transpositioned uh, using a different, using a different uh, set of moves. So by this, I mean that the uh, same position can be reached uh, via a different set but of, of moves, which is also logical. Uh, and unlike uh, because of this fact, uh, it would be impossible f to name Shangqi openings as the way it can be named in international chess, whereby 
uh, maybe a person or, name, uh, or a place is used to name a particular variation. In Xiangqi, uh, most of the names for the openings are descriptive in nature and would usually suggest or uh, tell uh, how the important pieces were played in the particular variation. Uh, there are some interesting names uh, to various openings and counters, like the blind dog counter, the turtleback cannons, the parrot cannons, the nightingale tortoise, the one horn monster, etc. Uh, these will be covered in an article over uh, for unorthodox openings. And <coughs> sorry, uh, we go to the mid game phase now. Now Huang Chen again uh, had something to say, and which I thing is some for, for thought. Now, in Xiangqi, because of the relative openness on the board, the main goal for the mid game would be to try to checkmate the enemy king at all costs. So very early into the game, maybe perhaps like 15 to uh, 20 plies per player, uh, there will be already attempts to try to uh, take down the enemy king. And when material advantage is present, uh, it will be of, it will be commonly seen for the player to play very proactively, and sometimes or many a times sacrifices are just planned and executed to try to capture the enemy king. And overall, sacrifices, uh, in my personal opinion, are much much more uh, prevalent in Shangqi than in international chess. And uh, there, there are also uh, some more slight uh, minor dif uh, differences. Um, but, but the more important ones, uh, the more important differences would be one of the most important ones would be the emphasis on gaining a slight advantage uh, in international chess, whereby hopefully the advantage will build up into a winning position. Now, this is also true for some of the variations in Xiangqi, but uh, because the king, enemy king, it's more prone to attack, uh, living just in the palace where he has to share with uh, the two other advisors. Uh, there are more ways to to checkmate, to deliver a checkmate. And because of this fact, uh, basic kills are a very, very important and fundamental subject to study. And that is why I have placed so much emphasis on uh, placing basic kills right immediately after the section on learning how to play Xiangqi. You have to learn to know the various basic kills because they will be attempted uh, slightly going to the mid game. Uh, there are also other differences between uh, in Xiangqi for the mid game, which I will leave to the reader to go look for himself. So, one of the basic questions, is Xiangqi more complex? Uh, Mathematical data has shown that Xiangqi would be uh, slightly more complex with a game tree complexity of 150 compared to 123 for international chess. But both forms of chess would uh, be significantly lower than Shouji or Wei Qi, uh, which is go in Chinese. So the rest of the article uh, was opinions by various experts, and one of this this uh, comment by one of my good friends, Sergei Kochiski, which who is living in Belarus and the father of Shangqi in Belarus, uh, it would provide some food for thought. Uh, please read it and reflect over some of the comments that he has made. So, uh, the, at the end of the article, there are also comments by uh, Grandmaster Larry Kaufman. Uh, Liu Shilan and uh, other Shangqi players. So, uh, if there is anything to be taken away from this short article, I would, uh, for the international chess player dabbling in Shangqi, I would hope that uh, you could be able to appreciate the differences in the density of firepower because really a relatively more open board would imply that you would have to play the game in a much, much different mindset as compared to international chess. In fact, uh, there, um, there have been many, in fact, most of the grandmasters or masters uh, of Chinese chess in Xiangqi 
are very very capable players of international chess or shoji or other forms of chess i coined the term chess polymath to refer to these players because they have track records to prove them and when they play one of their fundamental observations was that uh, because of this very open board uh, a lot of international chess players would try to uh, would try to slow down the pace of the game right at the beginning and choose to develop their horses or chariots much much later than they should have done and this would have significant implications because going to the main game uh, international chess players would often unknowingly uh, be at the at a disadvantage so this concept of density of firepower is one that I hope that the international chess visitor watching this video would really really take into mind and keep in mind when playing Shang-Chi and because of the greater space amount uh, that is also why I personally believe that Shang-Chi is a much much more faster game so and this you do not have to worry about pawn structure and you do not have to worry about where the enemy king will run because he will only stay in the palace so more or less the focus of the foresight of attack uh, can be uh, identified much earlier and strategy can be planned around the whatever <coughs> whatever tactics you want to use uh, very early in the game so i hope that you have enjoyed this video and this is the first time i'm using this wireless um, headset and a new camera uh, i think it's very good and uh, i'm glad i spent some money on it uh, i hope you also like the quality of the videos and this is more or less a test trial of the equipment which i'm still trying to learn i'm already get in my mid 40s and uh, learning all this new stuff is taking its toil on me so I'll still do as much as possible uh, for the love of Shang-Chi and I hope you like my work and if you really appreciate uh, all that I've done please subscribe to my channel and I'll try to make more and more videos over time thank you and please subscribe have a nice day